Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's SETS online webinar. As always, we would like to thank our sponsorship from EIS, which allows us to offer all these resources free of charge. And these include recorded lectures, previous webinars, learning tools, and even virtual field trips. So please check our website. Today's lecture is by Witold Szczuciński from Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. Witold has a double MSc degree from Christian Albrecht's University in Kiel and Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań, and he also got his PhD at the University of Adam Mickiewicz in Poznań. Now, Witold is a head of Geocazart Research Unit and Gamma Spectroscopy Lab, I'm sorry, Spectrometry Lab in Institute of Geology uh, in Poznań. Vitold has interest in contemporary sedimentation processes and particularly in glacial, coastal, and shelf environments, and in the sedimentary record and impacts of natural disasters like tsunami, and this is what we will be hearing about today, but also meteorite impacts, flood um, storms, glacial surges, and landslides. And his field work took him all over the globe from Greenland to Antarctus, but also to Vietnam, Thailand, Svalbard, and Japan. And I think that we will hear about all of these places in today's talk. And now, without further ado, please, um, be told you can start. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ola, for the presentation. Uh, good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, I'm, it's really a pleasure for me to join this webinar series and uh, to share with you kind of my personal uh, story about uh, curiosity, what is left after tsunami disaster. Uh, I will take a sedimentological perspective in, in this talk and uh, because as far as I am aware, we are kind of a mixed company. Some of us may be more familiar with this topic, some of some of uh, you may be uh, just uh, beginners in terms of tsunami sedimentology. So I will try to explain some basic things as well, and uh, not, not only to focus on the newest funding. What is left after tsunami disaster? It is a question which was asked uh, by many geologists in the past, before any major tsunami was documented by geologists. It is also the question which we ask nowadays and uh, uh, we are looking for the answer from various points of view. Uh, for all of you, tsunami is already a common term. It was not the case in two, 20 or 30 years ago before the uh, large uh, tsunamis in Indian Ocean or in, in, in Japan. However, for everyone, tsunami means something a little bit different. For some of you, it may be mostly related to geological processes, maybe disastrous or catastrophic, but uh, a process related to earthquake or to volcanic activity. For others, tsunami is mostly related to kind of natural hazards, danger, uh, something, a kind of process which needs to be treated in a kind of a very careful way with a focus on early warning, uh, evacuation, and so on. So this, these approaches will, will mix also in, in my talk because uh, it is a part of tsunami sediment geology or sedimentology where we are not only focusing on a pure science, but we are interfering with a society almost on the every step. Tsunamis are the most deadliest and costly disasters in history, in the history of human. And it is the major reason why they focus so big attention, at least during the last two decades. To give you two major examples, and I will come back uh, to, to these examples during my talk. 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, also known as a Boxing Day tsunami from 26 December 2004, uh, generated by earthquake offshore Sumatra, killed at least 230,000 persons. It affected many countries in South Asia, as well as in East Africa. If you look for a list of the most deadliest natural disasters, 
in the history, it is usually in the top 10 or even in top, in top three, dep depending on, on the counting and, uh, and approach used by the, by the authors. On the other hand, 2011 Tohokuoki earthquake and tsunami on March 11, this year is the 10th anniversary of this earthquake. Uh, it affected mostly Japan. Around 20,000 persons were killed by the tsunami. And it was the largest disaster in terms of economic losses, partly because uh, of a, a disaster of nuclear power plant in Fukushima. These two examples were not only imp very important for human history, they were also important for development of science. And if we look for tsunami scientific papers and various uh, databases, on the left-hand side, you got data from Scopus, on the right-hand side from Web of Science, you may easily notice that there is a dramatic increase in the number of publications related to tsunami after 2004 and then again after 2011 even more. From the moderate interest in tsunamis in the previous years where some tens of papers were published uh, annually related to all the aspects of tsunami, not, not just tsunami geology, uh, the number of publications has risen to more than 1,000 per year. A large part of it is focused on earth sciences, including sedimentology, because it's a really important part of tsunami, tsunami research. The history of uh, geological investigations of tsunami deposits, it's even shorter than the, the history of tsunami research. And there were some important papers published already in the 60s. However, uh, it is commonly as, uh, agreed that 1988 is really a kind of a beginning of uh, international studies on tsunami deposits and geological impacts of tsunami. There were three seminal papers published that year by Brian Atwater um, on Cascadia 1700 earthquake and tsunami, uh, Jody Bourgeois about late Cretaceous impact generated, asteroid impact generated tsunami and by Alistair Dawson et al. Uh, about Storega slide uh, generated tsunami and uh, tsunami deposits left in, in Scotland after that. The following years is, is the increase in interest, but as you know, may easily notice, this interest in tsunami is mm, far, far the biggest during the last two decades. In the effect, you may find a lot of publications, including important books, for instance, just published last year, Geological Records of Tsunamis and Other Extreme Waves, edited by Max Engel et al., or second edition of Tsunamites, edited by uh, Shiki et al., as well as a number of special issues, for instance, in Earth Science Reviews this year, related to 10th anniversary of the Hokuoki tsunami in Japan, and the last year, there was a special issue of sedi on sedimentology as well. And in the previous year, there were a number of special issues published in sedimentary geology, marine geology, as well as natural hazards and other topics. So taking into account this enormous amount of information which was stored during the last, uh, uh, last two decades, it's hard to pick just selected stories for you. So I decided to... Uh, follow my story by first introducing to uh, all of you what is really tsunami and why are we interested in studying tsunami deposits so much. Then I'm going to show you some typical tsunami deposits and factor affecting the variability. Uh, and I will follow it with examples uh, from my personal uh, research on, on tsunamis starting from Thailand, so in tropical climate for Japan and ending in Greenland and where a tsunami occurred as well. So let's start with a figure which was uh, 
a kind of introductionary figure to invite you for this for this talk. Uh, the famous uh, uh, wave by uh, Katsushika Hokusai, uh, drawn in the, in the beginning of 19th century, which uh, is a kind of icon of tsunami. You may find uh, this icon reproduced on, in many cases on tsunami evacuation roads, signs, and so on, as you, as you may see on the right. However, in fact, it is not a tsunami. It is how we imagined it to be, a huge wave, uh, almost a wall of, a, of, of water. And um, in fact, it, it is uh, partly because term tsunami comes from Japanese. Uh, you, you, might, you may find it here. And it's uh, translated as a harbor wave in old Japanese language. However, if we really would like to imagine what is actually a tsunami, then we need to focus on the on the process. Tsunami is a series of a very long gravity waves, uh, which are caused by rapid vertical displacement of a large volume of water. Mostly it occurs in oceans, but you may find them also in lakes. How long is the gravity waves? And the open ocean, it is an order of 200 kilometers or more close to the coastline, it's much shorter when the amplitude is, is going to be, to be higher and higher. But you may find still that even in coastal waters, the length of the wave is still in order of several kilometers. In the previous picture, you may easily see one crest and the second one and the boat filled with, with a crew. And it is easy to estimate the wavelength to be several tens of meters to approximately 100 meters. So it's much shorter than tsunami wave. In fact, in many reproductions uh, schemes, you may find a tsunami wave to be presented like a wall of the water. In fact, in, uh, it is much more common to observe tsunami to be as a kind of rising water level, rapidly rising water level, more or less like during a tide. And it is one of the reasons why in the past it was also called a tidal wave, a term which is right now abandoned. So we know already what is, <coughs> what's the tsunami, but what is the reason for the tsunami? Uh, actually, there are several processes which may generate such a long wave. The most common, and by far, uh, is the earthquake. But the earthquake, which is of particularly large magnitude, which is re relatively shallow, and the earthquake which produced vertical movement of a large part of the seafloor. You got here an animation of the movement of a seafloor during an earthquake on 26 December 2004, generating Indian Ocean tsunami. As you may notice, it is a large area. It's not just a spot, not just a focus on an earthquake, but large area which is generating, which generates the tsunami. Tsunami may be generated also by volcanic eruptions, landslides, which may be subaerial, like here. Here's a case from Greenland uh, from year 2000 when a rock avalanche generated submarine landslide. And due to that, a tsunami occurred in a Vigat Strait. Tsunami, which is uh, easily noticed on this picture, the, the range of tsunami is easily noticed because it was already snow covered area and everything which is uh, dark below snow line, it is the part which was covered by, by salt water and it was up to 50 meters above sea level. In some specific cases, uh, tsunami-like wave may be also generated by calving, iceberg rolling, uh, by asteroid impacts. Uh, there are also specific uh, meteorological conditions which may generate so-called meteor tsunami. And there are several other disturbances uh, which may produce um, a tsunami-like wave, long wave, uh, which affect the complete water column, which, what is very important. 
please note also that in many cases, it may be difficult to distinguish what was the actual cause. For instance, earthquake may also generate a landslide. So in fact, the effect in the tsunami may be a combined effect of both processes. Why is tsunami sedimentology research so important? Uh, I would like to give you a couple of examples to prove it. Uh, let's move back to Thailand and 2004 uh, before the tsunami. At that time, tsunami hazard was not considered to be a hazard for the Andaman Sea coast of Thailand at all. It was not only the case of Thailand. Uh, so there was no evacuation, there were no evacuation roads, no warning system, people were unprepared. In the effect, in the Indian Ocean basins, as I mentioned, over 200,000 people died and citizens of almost uh, over 50 states um, were affected by, by this uh, tsunami. It, it had a really global, uh, global range. So for instance, in terms of uh, victims, it was the most tragic natural disaster in history of Sweden, because in Sweden, there are no major natural disasters. Um, it's a relatively safe country in that terms. And a lot of Swedish citizens were during that time in Thailand for vacation. So we are, we are really in a, in a global world in this respect. Uh, however, a couple of years later, a paleo tsunami deposits were discovered in Thailand. If they would be, if it would be earlier, then there would be at least a knowledge that this particular coast was already affected by tsunami and could be affected again in the future. So, if we are, if we provide an accurate identification of tsunami or paleo tsunami deposits then we can identify that a particular coast is subjected to tsunami hazard. Another example, uh, let's move to Japan, Minami Sanriku. Uh, it's a, a town uh, which was established uh, relatively late in 1889, and it was flooded in 1960 by Chilean tsunami. The water level was almost three meters high, higher than, a, than a usual, and there were extensive damages. It was a tsunami which was generated by 1960 uh, earthquake next to the coast of Chile, which tsunami wave propagated across the Pacific Ocean that was still relatively disastrous along the coast of Japan. Uh, because of that tsunami, uh, there were several changes uh, for instance, storm tsunami gate was uh, was built. There, there was a memorial to to keep memory about this this event. And every year, in an anniversary of, of that tsunami, was a kind of training drill provided for for the citizens of Minami Sanrico. In 2010, was another tsunami which was also generated by earthquake next to the coast of Chile. It was much smaller and with small damages. Uh, however, people were prepared for a tsunami in order of plus three, plus four meters. However, in 2011, tsunami was much higher, much higher than 14 meters, and 95% of the town was damaged. So it's another reason why we need paleo tsunami record because we need not only to provide information that the coast is at danger, it's, it's potentially hazardous, but we are able to extend the historical record and we may assess earthquake and tsunami frequency and possibly also magnitude. So to summarize this, we need the sedimentological research on tsunami because uh, it helps in identifying identification of tsunami hazard, because it helps in the long-term recurrence interval assessment. It helps in estimation of potential inundation area, so the area which is flooded by the tsunami, in estimation of at least minimum flow height, flow velocity. 
If we employ the modeling, it helps also in estimation of earthquake magnitude, which generates a tsunami. So altogether, it provides a kind of worst case scenario, as well as give us information about the development of particular tectonic zones. So we know that tsunami deposits helps in tsunami hazard assessment, but then it's a, a good question, how tsunami deposits look like? From the early works, uh, which were summarized, for instance, by Morton et al. in 2007 in a review paper in sedimentary geology, uh, we have um, a kind of a common knowledge that uh, in case if tsunami deposits are left on land, on a coastal plain, kind of wetland or in swales, then they may have relatively typical sequence. So, commonly composed of sand, which usually fins and finds landward. They are usually, the deposits are usually depo left from, by settling from suspension. Um, a kind of mud cap is commonly found on, at the top of them. The origin of the sediment is uh, mainly marine. They, they have usually marine in geochemical indicators contain marine diatoms, foraminifera, uh, if there is a, if there is a mm, rocky coast, there are usually boulders left uh, on land, uh, which are even more complicated to, to be really interpreted as a tsunami, uh, of a being of tsunami origin. Uh, the thickness of the sandy layers is not particularly thick. It's usually an order of five to 25 centimeters. Uh, it is on land. What is typical in, for offshore tsunami deposits uh, is uh, still uh, under discussion because there are just a dozen of papers documenting offshore tsunami deposits. And uh, in most of cases they are quite variable from site to site. However, are the these typical tsunami deposits really typical and is it really enough to know these indicators to identify them? Uh, unfortunately not. It's mostly because of a type of a process, which is tsunami. Um, let's consider at least four uh, additional issues. One, sediment sources. Tsunami may transport uh, sediments from offshore, from beach, from dune, from erosion of, on soils in various proportions so the type of a tsunami deposits which we found is dependent on sediment source. And depending on the sediment source, the tsunami deposits may be composed of mud, as you've got here, or boulders or sand. Uh, and so may be very, uh, may vary a lot. Then the position or environment. Uh, it may be a coastal plain, but it could be a coastal lake. It could be continental shelf and wetland. So, in each case, we may also expect a difference in sedimentary record. Then tsunami provides not a single sedimentary process. In the previous slide, you saw a kind of sequence which was explained by suspension setting. So the, the authors suggested that during the run-up, during the flooding phase, the velocity is slowing down. Uh, and it provides conditions for the sediment, which was in suspension, to settle down uh, and, uh, and be deposited. However, there are many uh, observations of deposits which, were depo uh, which are typical for high density flow. And there are deposits which look like typical overwash deposits. Uh, in offshore environment, in particular, we may have also in tsunami induced turbidity currents. So there are, non, there are many processes which may be um, uh, related to single tsunami. In single tsunami, many depositional processes may be added. And last but not least, uh, all of these deposits are subjected to depositional changes, mixing, dissolution, er erosion, soil formation, uh, wave action, and so on. Uh, 
each of them is different in in different depositional environment and so on. So after seeing the previous slide, you may have an impression that it's relatively simple. After seeing this slide, you may have the impression that it's impossible uh, to identify the tsunami deposits. And it is why we go to various places and to study the fresh tsunami deposits and to try to see what is really left after major tsunamis. Um, of course, what is left, what is preserved, depends not only on the factors I mentioned before, but it, uh, it depends also on accommodation space, which is not only the geometrical accommodation space, but also depends on the type of climate. Is it arid or, um, or with heavy rainfalls uh, and so on? So we got one more critical aspect to, to be considered. Uh, the first tsunami uh, I had the opportunity to study was uh, uh, Indian Ocean tsunami and deposits and environmental impacts um, left in uh, along the Andaman Sea coast of, of Thailand. Um, in that part of the coastline, the tsunami wave height uh, reached over 20 meters above sea level with inundation distance inland reaching over one kilometer. And, uh, we found the whole variety of deposits. So we found boulders, uh, which were composed of granites, but also coral reef boulders. Next to the boulders were deposited sandy deposits. So it's possible to have such a kind of bimodal deposition as well. Uh, dominating type was sandy deposits along the coastline, but they were not uh, in some cases, they look like typical tsunami deposits, but in many cases, they were quite variable. So in some, they were sometimes laminated. There were some specific uh, features related to kind of vortexes within the water flow. Sometimes ripple marks were preserved on, on the surface or a, or a salt crust. Um, in terms of the thickness, they were generally between few centi one centimeter to um, at maximum 60 centimeters, but usually approximately 20 to 30. And in general, there were thinner and finer, more inland. But as you can see from uh, thickness distribution, it was not always the case. The coast, the coast is on the left-hand side, inland is on the right-hand side, and Sometimes it was just decreasing inland. Sometimes we got a kind of bypass zone with no deposits, then a deposition and, and thinning landward. So it, it is very much dependent on the local situation, on the local morphology of the presence of um, plants, trees, and so on. In the case of uh, Thailand, it was relatively common to find also finding landward in terms of a grand size. And because the major sediment source was usually beach and shallow offshore. And uh, this uh, offshore uh, provenance was approved by common marine components like diatoms, like foraminifera, uh, heavy mineral assemblages, uh, and, and so on. So one may say that it was relatively close to this typical tsunami deposits which were presented before. The question uh, was open, what will be left after that? Is the salinity indicator uh, preserved after first rainy season? Are the microfossils going to be, to, to be preserved? To answer this question, I had opportunity to be, revisit the same places several times over the uh, following years. Uh, we are in tropical climate, there is a rainy season with very, very high precipitation in order to of three to four thousand millimeters per year. Uh, so we may ex expect a major changes. Well, one major change which we could observe with a naked eye was uh, a very rapid development of of, uh, of plants. So it is this picture taken from the same site in 2005 
in February, so approximately one and five, six weeks after the tsunami. One year later, two years later, three years later, the picture uh, was not taken be just because the plants were so high that it was not possible to take the picture. Uh, and after five years, uh, after the tsunami. In some settings, the tsunami deposits look almost untouched, just with a thin soil cover, new soil cover on, on, on the top. In other cases, uh, it was really hard to recognize them because the new soil developed within the tsunami deposits. So without earlier knowledge about it, it was pretty hard to, to identify. Uh, Observations which were made during the following years uh, allowed, uh, led to conclusion that in most cases, it was necessary for the tsunami deposits to be at least 10, approximately 10 centimeter thick to be, to, be to be preserved. And in this context, uh, only half of the inundation distance was really recorded in, in a geological record because far inland, the tsunami deposits are usually thinner. So the chance for preservation in geological record is, is much lower. So it's kind of important conclusion for what we can re really read from tsunami deposits. It is a kind of minimum estimate of the maximum inundation, maximum flooding distance inland. Well, but the thickness of the tsunami deposits is not the only change. Uh, we, we notice also dramatic change in salinity, for instance, uh, and, and sodium and chlorium, and, and dissolution of uh, diatoms uh, and uh, of foraminifera. Uh, but some of the chemicals which were noticed in tsunami deposits, like heavy metals and uh, metalloids, were still high after several years and a number of processes related to a soil formation. Uh, on one hand, during the first seasons cause massive changes inside within tsunami deposits. However, later on, help to stabilize them and to protect against erosion. Well, we know something about what happened on land. Uh, so what about marine uh, tsunami deposits? Uh, a few years after the tsunami, we managed to, to map part of a seafloor next to the coast of Thailand, uh, here next to Pakaran Cape. And you may see that there is a very uh, mixed pattern of uh, surface sediments. And uh, when we looked into details, it appeared that only in very specific places in the mud covered area in relatively shallow water within few kilometers from the coastline, we could find sites where tsunami deposits were preserved. But it was only very local. They were usually very coarse grained with uh, parts uh, which were easily identified as a debris from the damaged buildings, uh, coarse grained sand, gravel, and, and, and so on. So it was not a widespread kind of deposition over the shelf. It was very localized. When we looked in more offshore on continental shelf and the water depth like here 50 meters, it appeared that tsunami from 2004 was not even recorded, at least not in the resolution of one centimeter, which was a, applied here. Uh, it, what was recorded, there was a kind of event layer related to likely typhoon in the late 80s. There was a major typhoon in 1989, uh, which provided a kind of finding upward uh, sedimentary sequence, a uh, few centimeters thick, and was also well uh, recorded and uh, led to 110 profile. However, uh, tsunami itself was not really recorded, at least not at the sites we, we investigated. Let's move to another climate zone, to Japan and the region affected by Tohokuoki tsunami on March 11, 2011. Uh, we are nearby Sendai and Sendai airport, which was completely flooded. 
And many investigations were done along at survey transect next to the airport uh, where tsunami reached almost five kilometers inland and the um, tsunami wave height was uh, up to 11 meters above sea level. Uh, we investigated this transect in high resolution, uh, analyzing sediments, uh, the thickness, the type of sediments, the geochemistry, grand size, almost all the uh, indicators which were previously applied for tsunami deposits, we tried to test on, on this transect. And we noticed that there were many features which were not really typical for tsunami deposits. So for instance, the thickness generally decreased landward. However, as you may see, the layer was not continuous and there was a lot of variability along this five kilometers long uh, transect. Um, Tsunami deposits were not composed of sand only. It, they were composed of sand and mud. And after approximately 2.6 kilometer, the sand was not present anymore. There was mostly mud layer, uh, which was not considered to be typical for tsunami deposits before. Uh, tsunami deposits appeared to be laminated. So again, a feature which was rather considered to be typical for storm deposits, not really for uh, for classical tsunami deposits. There were many features like mud cap, mud cracks, current ripples, uh, creep up class and so on re reported in, 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 in the deposits uh, as well. When we looked for the sources of the sediments, uh, applying for instance, um, and grain size analysis, uh, we got the typical grain size distribution for beach and for dune. And it seems that tsunami deposits, the sandy tsunami deposits are mostly from this source or are just finding landward. However, after approximately two kilometers, we got another source. The source is very local. It, it has a distrib the same distribution as a local soil. So the tsunami deposits, which are deposit left in the most landward part between two and five kilometers landward comes from local soil. And actually there is no offshore components in these sediments because typical grain size for the offshore sediments are hardly present in, uh, in, in tsunami deposits. It was confirmed for instance by diatom analysis as it appeared that the diatoms which were found in tsunami deposits were brackish freshwater they were the same as in the soil underneath the tsunami deposits. Uh, it was also confirmed by geochemical and uh, heavy mineral analysis. So it seems that in case of 2011 Tohoku Oki tsunami, the major sediment source was upper beach and dune. And in this way, we miss a typical marine indicators in these deposits. A uh, few months later, after the tsunami was a uh, typhoon, uh, which uh, affected the, the same area. Uh, we were fortunate to, to revisit the area shortly after the typhoon and check if tsunami deposits thickness change after that. And it appeared that it, the changes were very minor. Unfortunately, uh, one year after the tsunami, already most of the area was cleaned uh, be, uh, by the restoration works and the tsunami deposits are not preserved anymore uh, in the area be because of cleanup work. However, we could still observe some post-depositional processes. For instance, uh, a lot of wind activity and the olean transport. And that is something we are not really able to detect in in a fossil record because it's the same type of sand. It is just redistributed by, by wind action. And actually it may change, for instance, the extent of sand layer uh, over the land. And as you may see, the, the wind ripples are clearly visible still in, in May. So uh, two, three months after, after, after the tsunami, but after half a year, they are hardly seen. Uh, after the typhoon, there was a minor redeposition of a sediment and you may see a, a mini deltas formed in a local uh, local size 
Uh, however, this minor redistribution is related in large part uh, to, to local gradients, to local morphology. Uh, this redistribution was possible only along the dunes, which are relatively low in this area, up to three meters above sea level. The rest of the a flooded area is simply so flat that the water after the typhoon was standing and it was not really affecting the sediment in terms of sediment transport. Let's move uh, it because the tsunami deposits are not preserved, are cleaned up. So we looked for paleo tsunami deposits in, in Japan. And uh, let's move to Hokkaido Island where well-preserved tsunami deposits are documented for a pretty long time. They are preserved in a kind of a wetland with low pH. And because of that, uh, one of the typical indicators of marine origin of tsunami deposits for aminifera tests were dissolved. And it was one of the reasons why we uh, decided to apply a novel technique, uh, sedimentary DNA. So, and uh, DNA is present not only in our cells or cells of organism, but a kind of environmental DNA is present also outside of cells. It's, it may be also adsorbed onto sediment minerals. And uh, of course it is partly degraded, but still in particular cases, we are able to identify uh, what kind of species uh, is a particular part of DNA coming from. Uh, and we try to apply this technique for coastal wetland at Urahoro uh, on um, uh, the eastern uh, part of Hokkaido and uh, applying various tech standard techniques and also diatom and foraminifera analysis, we, it appeared that in tsunami layers, which are um, well documented in terms of grain size, in terms of sedimentary characteristics, uh, also containing uh, marine diatoms. Uh, there were no foraminifera because they were dissolved, but uh, there was DNA of uh, marine foraminifera present in the, uh, in the sandy tsunami layers, which were up to 2000 years old. Uh, this technique is still tested for various tsunami and storm deposits. So probably in a couple in the next months or next next year, a new results will uh, will appear, will be published. Uh, however, I would like to mention that it is a potentially very pro promising and powerful tool, not only for identification of tsunami deposits, but also for uh, interpretation of a longer sedimentary sequences. Well, uh, it was pretty hot and, and wet in Thailand. We moved through Japan. Let's jump to Greenland, another area where we may have tsunamis. In this case, we had a tsunami which was triggered by a landslide, not by, not by an earthquake. Uh, its extent was much smaller, but uh, locally the run-up height was pretty pretty high, up to 50 meters above sea level. And uh, the deposits which were left were quite variable. We also had boulders. In some cases, they were imbricated. Uh, we had uh, coarse sand and gravel uh, sequences, partly laminated. Uh, the thickness of tsunami deposits was, was in order of centimeters to uh, approximately 40 centimeters at, at, at maximum. There were also some uh, spectacular features related to uh, icebergs and melting icebergs, which are also drifted onshore uh, with a tsunami. We call these features mud pads. Uh, however, what was really interesting was the insight into sediment sources, which we could observe uh, in this particular case. Uh, in the Vigat Strait, we had uh, excellent opportunity to observe two end members, which were quite clear in terms of visual observation. The beach 
uh, was composed uh, mostly of uh, uh, dark basaltic uh, sand and gravel, while at the limit of the tsunami, there were erosional scarps and reddish sandstone and matstone. What we observed in between was a tsunami deposit's thickness, which appeared to be first in the lower part, composed mostly of the deposits which were eroded from the scarps more landward, and then it followed by it, it was followed by deposits dominated by uh, basaltic beach sand, beach gravel, and then it was intermixed. It is a nice record of run-up and backwash, run-up and backwash, so flooding and receding water, and it points that uh, during the run-up, uh, the water velocity was still high enough, not only to transport, but still to erode the sediments, so no deposition take place took place. The first deposition took place during the backwash flow toward, back towards the, the fjord. Uh, unfortunately, it's not so common to have such an opportunity to uh, investigate the sediment source and uh, the, uh, the particular stages of uh, tsunami deposition, but it also provides uh, the insight into the process which took place during the tsunami. I mentioned at the beginning that the tsunami may be also generated um, by some kind of disturbance, like, for instance, rolling icebergs. And on the left hand side are screenshots from a, from a movie from Western Greenland where such a rolling iceberg generated uh, an incident wave, which was relatively long. So it, it is a, you know, close to the tsunami type. And on the right, right hand side is a record from a coastal lake, which was uh, flooded uh, once by, uh, uh, by marine waters, providing also sand from a coastal, from a coastal zone. And from the detailed analysis, and it appeared that the only realistic explanation is that this kind of event probably was caused by rolling iceberg, as we can ex exclude uh, other factors like uh, landslide or, or earthquake in at this location. So again, uh, the signal may be quite, uh, quite different depending on the process, on the local context, and it always requires a detailed analysis. Then uh, a topic which is uh, currently of my uh, in in my focus is how to identify the tsunami deposits and storm deposits. Both are very important for uh, identification. Storm deposits are very important in terms of interpretation of uh, climate changes, for instance. And we got this typical tsunami deposits and typical storm deposits. And already in the previous examples, you've seen that. In many cases, these typical storm deposits look like tsunami deposits. And you may also see on the examples right, right here, on the left-hand side are tsunami deposits from, from Thailand, which look pretty much like, have many features of this typical tsunami deposits. But then we got a layer, which is also kind of tsunami deposits, but it was deposited by a storm surge in 1497 along the Baltic Sea coast. Then we may have a typical storm deposits formed by washover uh, of sand. But in some cases, we may have also this kind of washover deposits present in tsunami deposits, like here uh, in, the, in the coastal zone of, of, of Japan. So right now, it, there is no single feature which allows uh, to identify tsunami deposits. Um, uh, Altogether, right now, are more than 30 paleo tsunami criteria which are used, including geological, chemical, biological, archaeological, also geomorphological, and very important, contextual. So we need to read to know what kind of environment are we um, uh, studying, uh, what is the local context, how was the paleogeographical evolution of a particular site, 
uh, evolving with time. Dating is also kind of crucial thing uh, for, for this ad identification. Coming to conclusion of this, uh, uh, of this short overview, I would like uh, to underline once more uh, that tsunami deposits, paleo tsunami deposits are really important, not only for uh, our uh, and for extending our knowledge about geological processes, but they are important because it is really a key to improve tsunami hazard assessment. They may be highly variable, and uh, it is partly because they may be they may have various sediment sources. They are left in various depositional environment, depends on accommodation space, and. Th so there is really local contents and variable proxies needed to be taken into account. There are also post-depositional changes, which were so far studied only in a couple of cases, and uh, they may vary among the environments, vary among the various climatic zones. We got, however, more and more new research methods like for instance, sedimentary DNA, organic geochemistry, and so on, which may help us in paleo tsunami studies. However, please note that none of them is expected to be a single perfect one. They are always, and they need to be always interpreted along with the other uh, indicators and in local context. And there are still many problems which are open, for instance, good identification between tsunami and storm surge deposits, um, or not to mention identification of tsunami deposits coming from various sources, for instance, landslide generated versus tsunami, uh, landslide, landslide generated tsunami versus earthquake generated tsunami and so on. Uh, well, at the very end, I really would like to appreciate a large group of uh, cooperators. So the results I presented uh, before uh, were mostly uh, due to very fruitful co cooperation, international cooperation with a number of colleagues and uh, many ideas uh, came, came from, the, uh, from them. Part of the study was funded also by National Science Center and uh, I hope that I uh, managed to provide you at least a uh, uh, good background into what is the tsunami and how useful could be sedimentology for the tsunami. And I would be happy to take uh, any questions from you. Thank you very much, Vitek, for this really insightful talk. And I have to confess that until now I was normally thinking about tsunamis um, like this really disastrous, very, yeah, disastrous. Um, here it goes again, events. And I think that I have learned really a lot from your talk, knowing that right now, knowing that they can have a completely different expression in the sedimentary record. Um, so yes, Please, right now, everyone can ask their questions. I will read them from the chat. There are already questions there. Please be sure to also write, where are you watching us from? Before I will start with the first question, Vitek, I really very much enjoyed. On one of your slides, you cited your paper as almost submitted. And I think that this is a very good practice. I think I might start to do it myself. So the first question is coming from Stephen from Wales. The chance of preservation in the examples that you showed from Southeastern Asia was low. However, these were in a tropical setting where weathering rates are high. What would the preservation potential be in more tempered settings? It's a very good question and I still work on it. So for instance, uh, in one of our recent papers, we, we, we showed uh, the preservation of uh, focus on various signals. Uh, in your question, you, man you mentioned the weathering. So the preservation of chemical signal is pretty low in this case. So we got a dissolution of, um, for instance, carbonates. We got removal of salt. On the other hand, in the Arctic, 
we got a permafrost and uh, the ground is frozen for most of the year. So there is only a very short period for dissolution processes to take place. So from this point of view, the preservation could be better. However, if we take into account the physical preservation of the layer as it is, it may vary. There is an in, in, very interesting work by Michela Spisky <clears throat> on the preservation in the arid climate. So uh, coastal zone of Peru and northern Chile. Uh, it is an area where chemical weathering is uh, very limited, uh, obviously. However, the eolian processes are pretty important. So if we got the sand which is left on the coastal zone, it could be really easily transported. Uh, and it may be very difficult to identify what, what is really due to tsunami, what is uh, due to uh, eolian processes. So uh, what we really need is to have more studies which are really systematic uh, and follow and kind of follow up studies after the position of particular tsunami deposits. And so in this respect, your, your question is really a perfect one for a new research proposal. Okay, um, next comes a comment from Yakov from Wales. Thank you for the interesting talk. And Sue would like to know, I don't know where is Sue watching us from, but she would like to uh, first, fantastic overview of VTEC and so complex. It really makes the point that, uh, oh, Sue is, from, Sue is from Dundee. I will start again with a question. Fantastic overview of VTEC and so complex. It really makes the point that good local knowledge of topography and bathymetric conditions are crucial to understand um, sedimentological, um, tsunami sedimentological imprint in the coastal zone. Lots of research, but much to discover still. Okay, this was, I think, more of a comment than the question. <laughs> yeah, if I may comment, make a comment to this comment, uh, <laughs> please note that in many cases, uh, during the recent works, it's often that we start to investigate particular environment after the event. So actually, uh, what we miss is uh, often we miss, uh, for instance, detailed topography, detailed bathymetry before the tsunami or before the storm. Uh, we usually we know what, how it changed after, uh, we know the situation after, we do not know how it was before exactly. And it is one of the failures in, a, in our research. Okay. Um, Ahmed, uh, thanks you for your presentation. Stephen, again, still from Wales is asking, has there been any investigation of the anthropogenic component, plastic, glass, concrete, as a contributor to tsunami deposits? And I have to say, I wanted to ask the same question too. Yes. Yes, uh, it's it's really important indicator, in particular in, in the recent cases, as uh, even in case of uh, deposits which were left just a few weeks before, sometimes it's it's not so obvious uh, if they were left by the tsunami, which was a couple of days or a couple of weeks ago. Um, some uh, anthropogenic components are pretty useful. Uh, for instance, the plastics, which are floating, are useful in detection of the maximum inundation limit, as there is usually a kind of swash line left, or the maximum water level is also often reported by the remnants of nets uh, or, or plastics uh, somehow somewhere in the, in the trees. It, it is what we use during uh, post-tsunami field surveys as, as, a, as good indicators. But uh, obviously is this comp these components are also important uh, in, within tsunami deposits and it is on various scale starting from uh, for instance parts of brick and concrete which are found in offshore deposits and are useful indicators of uh, dramatic strong flow uh, to um, uh, chemicals which we use. And it was a recent paper by Piero Belanova. Uh, for instance, we, we work on tsunami deposits in Japan looking for uh, applying organic geochemistry and use, looking for particular 
contaminants, pollutants in tsunami deposits. So uh, it is still possible even to look for particular sources of pollutants on land, uh, which are point sources like uh, fuel tanks, uh, like uh, some factories and so on. And it helps in a, a reconstruction of uh, tsunami flow patterns and, and so on. So yes, we use them and we we'll probably will use them more and more. Yeah, that's, that's quite really fascinating. If I could just briefly top up this question, I imagine you also see an increase in this anthropogenic component over time between, I also imagine that it's probably depends from tsunami to tsunami, how strong it was and, and it's not so easy, but do you see actually an increase in the anthropogenic component or, or you wouldn't be able to say that? Well, I do not remember a particular study really focused on this, uh, on this question. So uh, it is, uh, in, the in the modern recent tsunami deposits, it's quite common to find in particular plastic and so on. Uh, if we go back, for instance, to the famous 1755 Lisbon tsunami, there are uh, in some parts uh, 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 bricks or some ceramic, but it's, it is also found uh, in uh, older paleo tsunami deposits from the Med Mediterranean region and in fact, uh, uh, it's used as also as a kind of indicator uh, of rapid uh, rapid flow. Uh, uh, so um, again, it, it's difficult to compare in systematic way. Even tsunamis at the same coast are quite variable, and even if they are of similar magnitude, they may provide quite different impacts. Please keep in mind, for instance, such a small factor like uh, tidal phase. And in Thailand, for instance, in 2004, the tsunami uh, height would be uh, two to three meters lower if it would be just uh, 10 hours, 12 hours before. Uh, it was just during spring tide and during high tide. So kind of with luck, right? No, yeah, I think that this is, there are quite many influencing factors and one cannot account for all of them. Um, the next question is from Lucas from Switzerland. Thank you for this amazing talk. It was nice to see comprehensive and quite exhaustive review of the research focusing on tsunamis from the last decades. You have presented a new DNA tool, which is, uh, I'm sorry, what is the age limit of preservation of this organic material? Uh, could you re uh, repeat the age of uh, DNA? Yes. Um, what is the age limit of preservation okay. of this organic material? Um, it, uh, well, it depends on the conditions which it is preserved. Uh, uh, the case study I presented, we had an age limit of approximately 2000 years, but we simply found it in the oldest investigated tsunami layer. So it could be more. Uh, sedimentary DNA, is uh, uh, very uh, rapidly developing a uh, new technique. So we observe pushing this boundary of age uh, more and more uh, with time. And in the deep sea, this, uh, they are sediments with uh, sedimentary DNA interpreted and uh, relatively well preserved uh, being several tens of thousands years old. And um, if we look into the permafrost, and uh, this time limit is even pushed even, even more back. Uh, so uh, I actually think that uh, it is likely that in some uh, privileged conditions, we, we may go back even several hundreds of thousands of years. There are some um, reports providing uh, dates like 2 million years old, but they are somehow questionable because it depends what we are looking for. If we are looking for DNA of higher organisms, then they are degraded so much that it is really hard to interpret uh, the, the, the DNA chain is, is too short. If we are going to look for microbes, it's much easier to find them because they have pretty short DNA uh, however, some microbes may still live in the sediments, 
Uh, so they do not need to be just deposited and left uh, several thousands of years ago, or several hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, we have the whole sphere of geosphere of microbes living within the continental crust, oceanic crust, within the sediments. So uh, it, again, it depends what are we exactly investigating. The next question is very similar. It's from our own Valentin from Oslo. Great talk, Vitek. How old can a rock be to be analyzed by this sedimentary DNA method? So yeah, I guess that you have just answered this question. <laughs> yes, but to answer precisely, the rock could be uh, as old as possible to be analyzed. Uh, to provide reasonable results must be relatively young. <laughs> Um, Marek from Krakow, thank you for a very interesting talk. Do you have any message based upon your experience addressed to those who work on deep marine mass transport deposits, MTDs, oligostroms, and so, and try to interpret some of these in terms of tsunamis as a trigger? Yeah, uh, that's, that's another very, very interesting story. Uh, I had pleasure to, to work with Michel Strassel, who gave a talk uh, earlier in this webinar series and, and in Japan Trench. And uh, it's one of our best examples. The, the second example uh, are works from the Mediterranean Sea. And the problem is that massive uh, uh, gravity processes, mass transport processes, maybe induced by earthquake itself. So they do not need tsunami. So is it possible to, that tsunami trigger them? Yes, it is. And how do we know it? Uh, just because 2011 earthquake and tsunami in Japan, there was a series of uh, seismometers on the seafloor. And uh, at least one of them was moved by a turbidite and it was recorded after the tsunami, so not after the earthquake, tsunami was delayed uh, approximately half an hour after the earthquake. Uh, so it is well proven that it was generated by tsunami. However, how to differentiate them? In such a setting like uh, uh, Japan Trench is pretty hard. We are testing right now, for instance, DNA again, uh, if it could be a useful, a useful indicator for source sediment, for source environment. In the Mediterranean Sea, there is uh, a, an approach using terrestrial geochemical indicators, because if we assume that tsunami flooded land and with a backwash brought some fresh terrestrial sediment, then it should be also preserved in this mass uh, transport uh, deposits. Uh, but uh, mm, I think that it is a nice topic to be investigated, but we are far, far away from the final answer. Sorry. Next question is from Philip from Berlin. Hello, Vitek. Thanks for the talk. If you were to find a sequence of repeated tsunamis deposits in a location where tsunamis are not considered a probable risk, what are the chances of the scientific community to change the public mindset to improve local disaster readiness? There are plenty of negative examples. Are there any positive examples? This is a, this is a question of a slightly different sort. <laughs> yes, but it's a very important question. And fortunately, my answer may be positive, yes. Uh, probably the first uh, coastal tsunami hazard map was uh, uh, generated for Hokkaido Island, and it was almost entirely based on geological record. Right now, the politics uh, in Japan changed uh, really a lot, and uh, tsunami geology is a part of tsunami hazard assessment. It was one of the biggest failure between 2011 not to include it. Um, if you look at the west coast of US, there was no major tsunami, for instance, in the Cascadian region in uh, Oregon, Washington during historical time. The 1700 earthquake and tsunami, which is right now 
pretty well known from various uh, lines of evidence, it happened when the Western coast of US was not on the maps. So they were a, a native uh, 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 people living, of course, and there is a kind of oral tradition, uh, but it, is not, it was not documented in historical documents, at least not on the, um, on the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. It was documented in Japan because the tsunami was big enough to travel across the, uh, the Pacific and uh, to, to make damages in, in Japan. And because of that, it is a fantastic detective stories. Finding a tsunami deposits on the, uh, on the coast of Cascadia, on the west uh, of the uh, US, uh, then dating of it, finding the uh, uh, documents in, in, in Japan, Provi all of that provides uh, such a detailed information that we know the exact date, the exact time of the earthquake and tsunami, relatively precise magnitude, and the whole coast, west coast of US is subjected to uh, tsunami hazard zonings, uh, evacuation roads, uh, there is a tsunami warning system, and mainly it is based on the geological evidence. You can so I hope that this approach will be also implemented in, in our areas. You can always see a smile of my, on my face when there is a question in the chat popping up from the lecturers at the university where I was doing my master's. And this is exactly the case. So the next question is from Ziggy from Krakow. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Sedimentary material is a mixture of marine and land materials. How geochemistry might help? Well, uh, geochemistry is a powerful tool if we use it wisely. So uh, in the relatively recent environment, uh, the first thing we need to consider is not just to make analysis, elemental analysis, but also to take end member samples from marine, coastal, and uh, terrestrial environment. We must take into account that uh, it's not so simple in a coastal setting like, like it may be in the, in the deep sea setting. So for instance, we may have a uh, element of titanium, which is usually considered as a typical terrigenous element. And in the deep sea investigation, paleoceanographic investigations, it's, it's typically used as indicator of terrestrial input. However, titanium is also in uh, heavy minerals and uh, heavy minerals are usually enriched in tsunami deposits. And it will may be simply an indicator of high uh, flow velocity. So without detailed consideration, we cannot use it as simply as in our environments. Then we may use uh, uh, not just elemental analysis, uh, but uh, we also apply, for instance, speciation and fractionation. So we analyze, uh, for instance, water soluble fractions and uh, bioavailable fractions, and also various forms of particular elements. For instance, in Thailand, we investigated arsenic, which is at plus three and plus five, uh, depending on the amount of oxygen in the environment. So plus three is more typical for, uh, for uh, suboxic uh, environments so or marine sediments. And in the fresh tsunami deposits, it was uh, <coughs> quite a lot of arsenic was at plus three uh, valency. Uh, however, after one year, uh, the deposits were oxidized and everything was uh, plus five. So it is uh, uh, something to be taken into account, but some signals, some geochemical signals are not uh, lasting forever and maybe not as useful uh, as the others. We may use also uh, in stable isotopes, for instance, of, uh, of carbon, uh, as well as organic geochemistry, to look for the origin of uh, organic matter. Is it of marine origin or of terrestrial origin? But again, the same as with the other indicators, uh, we need to consider the local context and uh, uh, check them against the other, uh, uh, the other indicators. I mean, sedimentological, micropaleontological, and so on. 
Yeah, it looks like it's always good to have a hypothesis what we would like to check and prove instead of just measuring simply everything. Um, all right, so yes, I'm checking the chat and I see no further questions. Um, if there are no further questions, maybe, oh, wait, wait, no, this was just a comment from Sets Online. Yes, thank you for great questions and comments from across the globe. Yes, um, thank you very much for joining this uh, webinar. And it will be recorded as usual, and you will be able to find it either in Twitter or on our website probably next week. So yes, thank you so much for joining us. And we told thank you, thank you very much for this really interesting talk. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much as well. I hope you, that you will find it, some of the information useful. And if you learn on the mistakes, learn on my mistakes. 